and I'm going to start the Q&A session with question two, Melissa Wilson, from her our first presentation. Uh, Dr. Wilson, this is this question is here in the chat, uh, question and answer pod. Any studies on how much commercial N can be reduced with and without the use of instincts? Yeah, this isn't my area of expertise because I typically focus on manure management. That's my specialty. Um, but there has been a lot more research on nitrification inhibitors with fertilizers, whether it's um, ammonia, anhydrous ammonia, or whether it's urea, et cetera, than there has been on manure, actually. So I believe those studies are certainly out there. Thank you. And then the next question here was, uh, how long does the product's effectiveness last, being an instinct? Could you use it to treat a manure pit to reduce ammonia, ammonium uh, levels, and therefore ammonia emissions? All right, so two-parter. So the first part is how long does this last in the soil? We're thinking probably only a couple of weeks, maybe four or five. It depends really on the year and the soil conditions. We've had studies in Minnesota where they used nitropyrin before it was commercially produced, and they put it on as early as late September, and then also did that later once soil temperatures were cooled. And in September, it, the nitropyrin didn't last as long, so there was actually still a lot of nitrification that happened over the winter because the nitrification inhibitor just didn't last. Um, so we have actually seen that. It's good for a couple weeks before soil temperatures get warm, but if your soil temperatures are still really warm and it's going to be a while till they get there, it, it might not last. Um, so that's what we've seen in our region. The second part was, could we add this to a pit to reduce ammonia emissions? And no, unfortunately, this particular product works on the nitrification process specifically. So it's only affecting the bacteria that transform ammonium to nitrate. So they don't have anything to do with volatilization, which means manure is already in the, or the nitrogen is already in the ammonia form, and then it can turn into the gas. That's actually just like a physical process that happens based on like how much wind movement there is above the pit, how warm it is, that sort of thing. So this does not unfortunately help with ammonia losses from pits. Thank you, that's very uh, helpful. The, the nitrogen cycle is the same in any state or region and um, we all should be aware of what's happening with it. I'm gonna move on to a question um, for Joe. And this is in the question and answer uh, pod. How did biochar addition to the anaerobic digester affect biogas production? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's a question that quite a, there's been a, quite a few projects that have kind of looked at this. And so in our study that we did, um, all the batch tests that we've done so far, there's been a little bit of increase in biogas production in terms of the quantity from our reactors, um, but generally it's not statistically significant um, depending on treatment. Um, and so that's it's similar to what we've seen in literature as well that have looked at the, the biogas side of things, the production side of things in the past where you might see a 10 to 20% increase, um, but we really haven't seen any consistency in our study that would suggest that biochar is really increasing the biogas quantity. Um, and same goes with the methane, methane concentration as well. You know, we really haven't seen much difference in methane concentration either. So if you're, um, this isn't in the pod, but if you're on the topic of methane, right, a, a powerful greenhouse gas that's associated with manure degradation, does the biochar that you've talked about, those processes and, and uh, the covers, et cetera, help with any greenhouse gas? Um, so that's another excellent question and um, something that we were looking at as well, so our analyzer could analyze greenhouse gas as well that we used on those manure bucket studies. Um, and one thing that we found was that in some cases, um, the, the the biochar did increase methane production a little bit from the storage, but it was very similar to what we had seen with the cover as well. So that kind of makes sense where you're adding more carbon to the system and just more methane is being produced during, because it is an anaerobic environment in that storage. Um, some of the biochars uh, we've noticed have uh, actually decreased methane production a little bit. 
or greenhouse gases in total a little bit. If you look at the equivalency, including in uh, nitrous oxide and um, um, and, and methane, um, corn stover and manure solids have actually decreased those greenhouse gas emissions a little bit. The woody biochars, we've seen more of an increase. And so we're still trying to narrow down exactly why that might be. Um, we think it might have to do with the carbon content of the biochar. Woody-based biochars are often much higher percent carbon than um, our agricultural residues, which are generally a little bit lower. You know, we're talking 60 to 70 percent rather than 70 to, to 80 percent like the woody biochars. So another question um, in the pod here, are metals or other compounds concentrated during the biochar process, uh, by biochar or, or formation of biochar, I guess, right? So as we produce biochar, what's happening with metals? That is something we have not looked into ourselves. Um, I know there's some at Cornell um, that have been looking into this a little bit more, particularly with some other compounds as well that could be toxic, that could be concentrating. Um, and that's something that has recently been brought more to our attention. That was something in future studies we're going to start looking at a little bit more closely. <laughs> I'm catching up. One of those in, in opera, uh, opportune moments when the, my computer popped up a screen that says it wants to update. So um, another question um, for you, Joe. Since we're on this topic of uh, greenhouse gases, I often deal in Pennsylvania with odor management. And um, one of our uh, BMPs for odor would be to add a cover to a, a liquid manure storage. And you talked about that. Does the biochar have any observations on how that might help? Yeah, so the odor, we believe it is decreasing. We didn't measure some of those volatile compounds coming off of them, but uh, the, the smell tests, you know, we could tell that there is definitely a difference coming off that that manure storage um, in terms of, of odor. And there's been a few other studies that have looked at this as well, and they focused on the odor compon component and have found that it, it can reduce that odor off of the storages. And that's, that's a complaint that we've had a lot in our area too, with sort of the mechanization of manure management, adding more waters, losing that cover. We've seen an uptick in complaints due to odors from dairy facilities, particularly in our region of the state. And, you know, thinking about adding covers is a way to help help reduce some of those odors. And we think biochar would be a little bit more of a long-term, uh, a suitable um, storage cover that could be used. Nice. Yeah, I noticed uh, during your presentation, uh, I work a lot with the manure shed uh, concept and some of your points really could fit into that manure shed relocation of nutrients in particular phosphorus and use the term densification of, or densify the phosphorus and i'm going to steal that and use that down my road so i'll put that in my lexicon i'm going to move on uh to a question for erica this was not in a chat pod but it was one that i was thinking about as i was listening to you describe the copper uh content in liver uh tissue of different age cows and was a little surprised, as you noted, that the older the cow got, it did not necessarily seem to mean that the liver uh, concentration of copper increased. And I wondered if that, if you know if that's part of the body flushing liver out uh, so that it's kind of the body is in a, some kind of equilibrium. So as copper comes in, it's going to also go out, which might reflect an equilibrium with the farm system itself. Or do you expect copper to actually bioaccumulate so the older cow actually may have been exposed to less copper over their lifetime? I, I think that there's a couple of possible reasons for this. It could be that at the time when they were harvesting at, you know, when this cow was younger, for instance, uh, the vet school in Iowa State told me that the the liver concentrations in calves is often extremely high like on toxic levels just for various reasons. And so the calf itself may have started out a little high. It might have been a drought year. The copper or the, the alfalfa they were harvesting that year may have been, um, you know, high in, al or high in copper at that year. If you were thinking about how old this cow was, she was nine years old. You know, that was 2012 uh, at that time when I collected those livers. So 2012, we know we had a terrible drought in 2012. So there's a potential that that 
their alfalfa harvest at that time was very high and she just kept that the, the whatever year it was that the cow was uh, as a calf it might have just continued to be high her entire life or another cow might have been extremely low in genetics and the variability in genetics and that particular animal it could be absolutely there just might not be any rhyme or reason to towards it I don't know there's a lot of different possibilities for it this cow may have been crossed with Jersey too who knows but okay. I was told they were all Holstein that, that's fair enough right um yeah but that leads us to a question that just popped in here. Um, and the question is pretty simple, and but maybe the explanation might lead us down a different road. Is copper transferred cross placental like lead? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I don't believe so, but I'd have to check into that one. That one I've not heard of. I know a lot of it comes through the diet. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good question though it is a good question and um sometimes you have to be uh you know one for often a very uh narrow expertise on people that would that would know that answer so we can keep asking different people uh and going get back to biochar joe is the creation of biochar a net zero carbon process that's a good question that I'm not sure if we have the answer to. Um, there, there's a lot of work going on. Um, I'm not a carbon market expert myself. It's an area that I need to educate myself on a little bit more, um, being in this this field. But um, you know, the in terms of the energy inputs, um, you know, it is a fairly energy intensive process to get the get the pyrolysis unit going. I know. Um, is it carbon or is it net zero? I I'm not sure. I'd have to ask some other experts on, on their opinion on that and delve into some more literature in that, that area. Excellent. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending. I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Wilson, Sanford, and Bierstrom. Uh, we'll take you uh, to the slide here that reminds you that as you exit today, you will receive that short uh, little pop-up with a few questions that really does help us.